his team at Cornell are devoted to solving contemporary issues uh, in dairy nutrition, physiology, and management. Uh, many of you are no doubt familiar with the significant contributions to the CNCPS system. Uh, been working on that for, for many years. Uh, current research efforts are really quite multifaceted. I know that because I just have to listen to Mike talk in various presentations, and he's, he's just got a wealth of knowledge to share. Uh, he's, his lab over the last 20 years has a, a pretty strong history in research to better understand the nutrient requirements uh, and management of calves and heifers, and that's what Mike's going to share some of with us today. Hey, thanks, Ben. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Bob, uh, for giving me such a to-do list that we'll be here until 6 or 7. Uh, I'm not going to do everything Bob suggested. I'll do a long time. I could talk about the Dutch famine and all that downstream effects, but that way off topic for today. So um, I'm going to focus on IGs, what's in immunoglobulins, but I'm not actually going to talk about IGs. I'm going to talk about all the other things that are in philosophy. And part of this is, you know, part of this focus of these things is how do we get started, how do we get them to be productive, how do we make them better. And to me, this is one of the areas that uh, we still kind of, I think we, we're misguided on some of the ways we've interpreted our own information. Okay? And I'm a conversational speaker, just like Bob, and if you have questions, please raise your hand and stop me. It's more fun to have a conversation than it is just to walk around and lecture. So what we'll do today is the introduction, effects of colostrum on growth of nutrient use, full colostrum and gastrointestinal tract development, uh, colostrum components in the immune system, Again, not focusing on the IGs. Right? I think we get, we get uh, enamored with the IGs, and that's not really where all the games are being played. Foster uh, components and things in metabolism that will summarize. So, Bob uh, was referring to some of the stuff that we do in Pro Dairy. I'm not officially in Pro Dairy, but I spend a lot of time doing extension work uh, with Pro Dairy. But I think this is a, a really big thing. Is this a little too loud? Is it okay? You know, what do we want for these heifers? Right? What do we want for them? How do we think about them? And Jason, Bob referred to Jason Carsey. Jason is the primary kind of economics guy. He does applied farm economics. I do the biology side of the two of us. Team teach a lot in our fellows program. And we're always trying to figure out how to put together the white program. And we have a bunch of dairy producers in the Northeast that are pretty ordinary, right? And they'll yell at us and we'll yell back, and it's all about the data and making the right decisions. And, um, you know, they'll tell us, how do we make a better quality heifer? And we'll say, what do you mean by quality? <coughs> right? And that leads to this really ambiguous concept of what is a quality heifer. So Jason and I have taken time to try to figure that out. I'm going to try to quantify some of that for you. Um, but that leads to these definitions and the expectations, right? So the primary goal of all heifer raising programs is to raise the highest quality heifer that can maximize or optimize profits. You can insert whatever word you want there when the animal enters the lactating herd. Okay? And, you know, the way we extend that is that quality heifers and animal carrying no limitations. Nothing that attracts the ability to produce milk under the farm's management system. And what the heck does that mean? What does a detractor take place? Right? There's some beautiful work out of Florida here, just down the road, that shows that, hey, when a calf is in a cow and that cow is heat stressed during the last trimester, when that calf hits the ground, that calf never grows as fast, and that calf never makes as much milk. So the detractor occurred in utero. Right? Are there other detractors along the way? And there are. You know, and in my way of thinking about this, I used to be able to work with a guy by the name of Bob Everett. Bob was a geneticist. Bob was a really interesting guy because he loved farms, he loved farming, and he understood dairy producers. And he and I would sit around talking about the potential for a lot of the Holsteins out there in our industry, like for forever. And, and we'd say, yeah, you know, this probably makes sense. So, the, so my perspective was always, you know, yeah, cows that are born that can make this much milk, and then everything we do <laughs> leads us to here, right? We actually take away from their capacity because it's not their genetics that determine this. It's the expression of their DNA, right? When are they told that it's okay to turn that stuff on and 
use all of that genetic capacity, what are they told actually that they can't because it's going to, they can't regulate it effectively given the environmental conditions, right? So tractors can happen. Bob alluded to the uh, antibiotic treatments, two antibiotic treatments. So that most, most places, antibiotic treatment means you've got a respiratory. Now, that could be bad lungs, but that could be that they were just sensitive to nutrient intake and uh, they didn't feel good, they didn't eat, and lost the capacity to make milk. Optimize profits by obtaining the highest quality heifer at the lowest possible cost, usually in the least amount of time. Right? Not that we want to keep harping on this acre for scouting, but that's our interval, right? If they're not productive, then they're not making us any money. All right, but we want to have that heifer that has no limitations. Um, if, but the lowest possible cost is not dollars per day, as Bob was alluding to. It's cost, it's return on investment, right? I've got dairies where we've, we've calculated that, hey, they're spending $1.80 a day to raise a heifer. Their cost per pound of gain is four bucks. Right? Where I got heifer, I got facilities, I got uh, farmers that are spending, you know, two fifty to three dollars a day, but their cost per unit of gain is a buck fifty. Right? Who's making better decisions there? It's return on investment is not cost per day. Right? Back to uh, quick and dirty numbers. Bob alluded to this, and you guys you guys can have these slides. I can send you this, send me an email. Uh, first calf peppers, we put this together a long time ago, looking at internal herd growth. Uh, but this helps us capture what's going on. If you know nothing about a dairy farm, and you get on the farm the first time, and you want to know something about, well, generally, what does their heifer program look like? Well, what do they treat? 24 hours to three months? What's the percentage? If you want this, our numbers are less than 30%. You know, is 100% of that here? Or is it evenly split? If it's all here, that says, hey, you know what? Those first few days are really terrible and maybe your housing is a problem. If they're, if they're out here, that says you've got some challenges with facilities and management. You just you cannot treat them very well once you get them past the end of the room and phase. All right, DOAs, you know, less than 7%. What's a DOA, right? Well, everybody's. Here's where we could use a better definition, right? Is it 24 hours? Is it 48 hours? Is it depth on uh, immediately close birth? Why do we have this in here? This just says you've got high DOAs, you've got bad protocol compliance, right? So it's a really fast indicator that protocols aren't being here too, right? So you can go in and figure out why. And here's where the money's made. First cap, first uh, average, first lactation average peak, greater than 80% of mature or equal to 80% of mature. First cap, the first lactation total yield, at least 80% of mature. We're not doing that in the industry. We are just not doing that. And most of the time we're not doing that. We might do a great job getting them pregnant at the right time, but after we get them pregnant, we send them down the road and we forget about them. And they just don't get the right body weight because we aren't measuring any body weight gain. So they grow with the expense of milk production and first lactation. And it's one of the biggest problems that we have. Um, 70, 68 to 72 is probably the number that I see the most, right, which means for the average dairy, you're losing about 8 to 11 pounds of milk a day on that first lactation. It's just a lost opportunity. It's not that you're not making milk, it's not that you you're not, can get more out of it. You're just doing it through expensive growth, right? When margins are tight like they are right now, that's a heck of a lot of milk, right? Especially if you got 35 to 40% of your herd in that spot. Okay, first lactation call less than 60 days of milk, less than five. MEs, I don't like MEs, but greater than mature. Uh, first cap period uh, lactation less than 15%. We want 85% retention that, to that second lactation. And whatever is the number one reason for the first lactation cold and these problems, that's what you go focus on first. So, anyhow, this is just a great way to get a snapshot of what's going on in the dairy. This is, these, that's your money maker right there. Um, a really simple, stupid graph. Everywhere I go talk about colostrum, I always get the question, bottles or buckets? Or tubing? Well, this is tubing versus suckling. You can see there's no difference. Right? I don't think it really matters how the cat gets colostrum. It's just that if you're going to give them colostrum with a tube, everybody's trained. Everybody cleans the tube. Everybody changes the tube out every once in a while. It's classic. Braided, so it doesn't cause problems in the, in the stomach or in the esophagus. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. IGs, 
Um, does it really matter if you cycle or two grit? As long as you get them in there, wash them to it, uh, they should be good. Okay. So that leads to the, the real topic, the lactation cycle and the opportunity to provide bioactive factors. Uh, this was a graph or a figure in a paper published by Blum and Baumrichter back in 2002. And, you know, this is our, our lactation cycle, right? The cow dries off, or we're a heifer, and, and we're going to grow a mammary gland, and while we're growing that mammary gland, there's lots of things going on. We've got a lot of IGF-1, we're pulling in IGs, we're pulling in some insulin, um, IGF, and I said IGF-1, TGF-alpha, there's a whole list of things, uh, growth factors that are being uh, developed, used, reduced in that gland, and then she calves, and those growth factors are still there, Calf consumes them. We establish normal milk production. There's not a lot of those factors in milk at that point. She dries off. We go through the same thing, you know, involution and then and development, hypertrophy of the gland, and then we do it all over. So we have this little window of time here where we can deliver some of these factors to the calf. The question is, does it mean anything? Right? And this is a topic that's been looked at a lot. The problem is we haven't actually looked at it uh, in a systems-wide basis. Uh, Long uh, Switzerland worked for years and published hundreds of papers, you know, three days, four days, five days. It's like a machine. Brilliant scientists, great physiologists, did remarkable work, but looked in very short segments. And it wasn't until lately that his, uh, his students like Gerald Hammond have started to look at these things on a much uh, broader scale, still focused on some of the immediate factors and, and bio, bioactive factors and transporters, but also starting to look at the system. So the question is, does this have any impact on the cat? Then a few years ago, um, we pulled together this big symposium uh, to look at the mom and baby relationship, and we had all species, you know, we had humans, we had sheep, we had dogs, we had uh, pigs, had uh, cattle, obviously. And what had stimulated that was this paper published by Bartol and Bagnell where they synthesized the term the lactate hypothesis. Right? And really what that is is a definition of epigenetic program. And they're, these are swine reproductive physiologists. And they had observed 35, 40 years ago that there was something going on in the neonatal pigs, in the females, independent of their genetics that allowed them to produce more pigments. And they couldn't figure out what it was, and it was through the development of molecular biology te techniques that their research grew up through that whole era where they could start to look at where it's binding, what kind of receptors we have, what is binding, what is the molecule. And from all that, they developed this term called the lactate hypothesis that's internal programming extended beyond the human environment to ingestion of milk more and more plausible factors. I added this, milk in this case may include colostrum. Right? Because what they were trying to figure out is what is mom communicating to the offspring that would allow these piglets to be more reproductively efficient. They had some evidence that there was some communication between mom and the juvenile female that was allowing for more piglets. And it took them almost 40 years to figure it out. Right? It's a great story, all animal science students should do. And what they learned is that in neonatal pigs, maternal relaxant and colostrum stimulates the development and differentiation of the uterus. So the female pig born with a, with a juvenile uterus, the way those with relaxant is, you know, it's that hormone that causes the malignants in the, the cow to relax and she can convert to the uterus. And uh, come to find out, maternal relaxant actually stimulates the development growth of estrogen receptors. So if that baby piglet gets a little bit more, uh, consumes a little bit more of that colostrum, with that relaxant in it, it stimulates the growth and development of the uterus, which means for the rest of that life, that piglet, when she becomes a sow, has more room, she can now do what? Produce more babies. Okay? Really fascinating first hour of life. Right? First meal. First meal says, Independent of your genetics, I can make you more reproductive than that. Okay? Isn't that a fantastic idea? So, you know, and they, they did a lot to talk about what that happens. And I, I learned the most when I was drinking beer with these guys. 
And uh, I got Skip to the side. He said, Skip, I don't know much about pigs. You know, a little bit, but not a lot. How much possible does the average pig get? He says, about 15 mils. I said, what's it going to take to get this effect? He says, if you can get 30 mils in, I can guarantee the effect. Right, so you got to double it, but 30 mils, 15 mils, that's just not a lot, right? We're talking about really small amounts, so a lot of power in a small volume of the material. Right? And they have, uh, this is a publication from 2008, this is one of the cartoons, and they actually talked about relaxing beatings, how the relaxing will bind, whatever their factors are, stimulates the development of the estrogen receptor. Now you have estrogen binding, and you're getting more proliferation, and in the end you have a large plant. Uh, and they've got this characterized where these uh, mammary factors like relaxin uh, have action in this mammary gland for about three days, and after that, it's now local environmental factors, right? So, a really interesting discussion that begs the question, what about a cap, right? What's in there? It's getting into the cap, it's stimulating the growth and development of that cap independent of the nutrients that make them a better, <coughs> make them a better cow or make them a better calf. Right? Which leads to this question. What does mom want for her calf? Okay? What do you guys think? So what term comes to mind when you look at these two people? That is a female. That's always a question. I don't remember her name right now, but it is. She, she won, that's, you know, whatever. How you vote or not We don't want to be, be governor of, of uh, California, right? What do they want? What term comes to mind? Come on, you guys should be back. Louder? I hear steroids. Great, let's pick the steroids. Hang on to that. Yeah, I was a wrestler. I wrestled a lot. I lifted weights a lot. I was pretty strong. I could never look like that. Right? Not of my own free will. All right. So yeah, we'll come back to that. There's a cheat on this. It's down here in the corner. What's the term? Anabolic. Yeah, I think all moms. What do moms want for their offspring? They want them to be better. Right? I think moms, dams want them to grow be healthy, she wants anabolism, right? What she really wants for them is anabolism. How's she going to do that? Well, she's going to do it through nutrients, but are there other mechanisms by which she facilitates anabolic behavior? I heard somebody say steroids. That's a good question. Is mom going to give her baby steroids? Charlie says yes. How many of you think yes? Maybe you think no. Maybe you just don't care right now. <laughs> so, so if we look at, uh, and this is a partial list, right? Again, if we did everything that was in colostrum, we would have a couple pages around the wall there. So energy, we know there's higher energy in colostrum because there's higher fat in your terminal. IGs, obviously we focused on that for years. Lactoferrin, yep, want to help facilitate moving iron around if you get away from those iron loving bacteria like coli. Insulin, micrograms per liter, 65 versus 1, right? So we've got a lot of insulin in there. Glucagon, a boom bet, don't worry about glucagon. Boy, but look at that prolactin. 30 micrograms per deciliter, sure no 15. There's a boatload of prolactin. Growth hormone, yeah, not so much, but enough that it's detectable. IGF-1. That is a boatload of IGF-1. And I will tell you that it's highly bioactive. We'll talk about that in a minute. All right, leptin. Yep, there's a lot of leptin there. We know, I, we still don't know how much of this might get across uh, the gut. We know that if it got into circulation, it could cross the blood brain barrier and uh, alter things in the hypothalamus and change set points for intake. TGF alpha. Large amount of cortisol, yep, we know that's ubiquitous in these animals at this point because this is how mom and baby were communicating with the time to go. And you get to the bottom here and we got a lot of estrogen. Alright, so mom is doing what? She sent in a hell of a lot of signals to say go, go, go. Some of those are stop signals, but a lot of them are go signals, right? So back to an average, IGF-1, IGF-alpha, leptin, estradiol, 
insulin. You know, do you have some antis here? Yep, cortisol is going to inhibit some of that. That cap is so full of them, it's clearing pretty quickly. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, the other thing we've got to ask is if you could ask a cow, how many days do you make colostrum for? How many days do you think she'd say? Is it just one? It's not just one, but we act like it's just one. We manage like it's just one. Matter of fact, we act, manage like it's just the first milking, right? And it's more than just one milking. So this is a combination of data. Here's first, second, and third milking. And if you just come down here, you can see lactose 27, 39, 44. Okay, so by the third milking, we're headed towards mature milk. In terms of our lactose, we've got lactogenesis. We're starting to increase our volume. But IGF-1, 341, 242, 144. So even into the second day, or the third milking, whatever that means in terms of time interval, we still have, remember that in mature milk, it's less than one, right? So we're, you know, we're two days in, and we still got a bunch of IGF-1. Insulin's still high, vitamin A is still high. Don't underestimate the role of vitamin A here, as in mitogen, as a, as a hormone. Uh, it's still pretty high. Vitamin E, same thing. Not quite as potent as vitamin A, but important, right? So mom is making colostrum for more than one day, the way she thinks about colostrum. It might not be IGs. So there it might not be IGs, but there's other things she's worried about. So what we know is colostrum provides IGs for establishing capacity immunity, but it also contains a lot of nutrients and non-nutrient factors. So we got IGF-1 and we got insulin. We know there's receptors in the gut and other places that might stimulate cell proliferation, cell differentiation, and protein synthesis. So from our perspective, colostrum is a tool to dam the direct uh, life at the beginning of autonomous life. In other words, she's going to help that cat figure out what it's supposed to be. Okay. Do we have any empirical evidence of what this looks like, right? So I'm just going to quickly go through a few studies. This was published, uh, it's going on a long time ago now. Uh, data out of Arizona, brown Swiss calves, either two or four liters of colostrum in the first feeding. Then they gave them some extra feedings of colostrum. I'm only going to focus on the two or four liters. Um, you know, not a lot of calves, a little over 30 calves. This average daily gain is pre-pubertal, right? So this is from birth to puberty. Right, not just the weed. So 176 versus Q2, so not quite half a pound a day average daily gain difference. They didn't measure intakes, they didn't measure anything, they were all commingled. Bottom line is those cats that got more colostrum, the people with colostrum, uh, grew faster. Right? And as somebody who, you know, when trying to develop growth models from the CNCPS, I would be hard pressed to figure out what happened here because we don't have intakes, we don't have efficiency, we don't know anything about this. They managed them to get pregnant about the same time. Survival, 75 versus 87%. Those that received more colostrum had better survival. You know, these are low numbers for survival curves, so you can't do a lot with that. But those that survived made a little bit more milk, right? But really interesting indications uh, that giving them a little bit more colostrum gave us a better long-term response. Uh, some data from Virginia Tech. Um, Many years ago, Colleen Jones, this is over the first 29 days of life, they were using a colostrum replacer. So now we buy colostrum replacers to replace the IGs. Right? So the question is, um, do they do that? And the answer was yes. This colostrum replacer, which was a serum dry product, replaced all the IGs. So they fed the cats colostrum from the dam with a colostrum replacer. The milk replacer had plasma in it. They split the calves, that didn't really matter. The bottom line is there was nothing really remarkable here until you got down to feed efficiencies. I just averaged them. So the feed efficiency of the calves that the colostrum during this period was 0.4. The feed efficiency of the calves that we feed the colostrum replacer was 0.24. Okay? Was that the same for uh, non serum based replacers? Yeah, it's right there 0.43, 0.36, 0.22, 0.26. Full colostrum. Yeah. Yeah. But now the replacers are, 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 are colostrum based. Are they still serum based too? Okay. Yeah, there's still serum based replacers on the market. Which 
there's the pulse of the discussions, right? So, you can get IGs from many different places, but maybe some of those other factors that are in Colostrum are important, right? That's kind of where I'm going here. Some data from uh, Jim Drakeley's lab. Um, they kind of turned this around, looked at it a different way. They had cabs. They were looking at uh, convectionally fed cabs. It was one and a quarter pounds at 20 to 20 versus cabs that fed a more intensified diet at 28 to 20. They all received the same uh, starter. And when they looked at those two proteins, they looked at those cabs that had, and they measured IG status. And so the cabs with poor IG status uh, in both of those, uh, especially on the conventional, if you looked at them, there was really no difference. You saw this. You know, three times the level of the CRM IGs in the high IG status gaps, with no real remarkable difference in average daily gain, most likely because they were fed just above maintenance, right? But when you gave them enough, uh, provided enough nutrients above maintenance, and then you looked at the same kind of response where you had 609 versus 2,000 uh, milligrams per deciliter of IGs, now we see this uh, you know, three tenths of a pound of average daily gain difference uh, in those calves. So IGs as a marker to me says these calves receive more of those bioactive factors. It's not just the IG. That's been our proxy. We've looked at IG for years as a proxy. Okay. And again, when you can't understand something, you repeat the study. Uh, this is from Fernando Soberone's work. Uh, it's the only paper that hasn't been published yet. Uh, we gave them, again, back to Bob's point, four liters of full colostrum, highly, highly managed full colostrum. It took us months to put that, that cohort together because we tested for bacteria, IGs, and everything else. So four liters or two liters of full colostrum in an hour of birth, and then 12 hours later, we gave two liters to these guys, additional liters. We had them on a restricted versus an ad lib feeding. Restricted was so restricted, we didn't learn anything. Someone will talk about the ad lib. All in automatic feeders, which is what we needed in sample sampling. So high colostrum, high feeding rate, low colostrum, high feeding rate, 34 and 26 calves. You can see that those calves fed uh, four liters of uh, colostrum had much higher IG concentrations, but these guys are still in really good shape from an industry standard. 1,400 milligrams per deciliter is a good number. They're not efficient, they're just not the same. You see, no difference in birth weight. Uh, we use birth weight. It's always a common question. Uh, those birth weights are different by five pounds. Is that an effect? The answer is no, because we use birth weight as a covariate in all of our calculations. Right? So there's every cap is its own control. So uh, weaning weights 172, 159, average daily gain pre weaning 174 versus 148. So under the same feeding conditions, in the same environment, the same milk replacement, the same everything, those calves had more colostrum by two liters. You know, three I don't get it. We're pulling that right now. This is done a while ago. Average daily gain from birth to 80 days, 172, 145, so they maintained it post weaning. We had better hip height growth. I, I couldn't believe this. You know, bones the slowest growing thing in the system, you know, tissue. So when you uh, when I see something like this, you know, we were, we're pretty fastidious about these hip heights. Uh, to see this kind of a growth said that there was response that something about colostrum is helping those gaps redirect some of those nutrients. About seven pounds more milk replacer intake, not enough to explain everything that you see here. Grain intakes are pretty low because we're feeding a lot of milk replacer. And we've since fixed this problem, but you can see that post gas, post meaning average daily gain, 2, 4 versus 176. Now we're looking like the, that Brown Swiss study, the dry matter intake starts to separate itself out just a little bit. Right, so more colostrum early in life, better growth. How far out did we go? Uh, good question. You know, 80 days, they're probably going to weigh about 260. And we just finished the study the other day. Um, the best calves in 13 weeks, they weighed 340. <coughs> About two point, it's about three point four pounds a day per burn. We finally figured out what's needed. Let's get talked about that today. Colossal components. So many studies have been conducted to demonstrate short-term response to the hormones and growth factors. 
No response is enhanced protein synthesis, increased enzyme expression, creative, creative gastrointestinal tract development. What this really says, you know, we talk about IGs as our immune system, but if mom is also supplying things to help grow the gastrointestinal tract, that's a better barrier to infection, right? That's our first line of defense. Plus, we'll have more surface area for digestion and absorption, more capacity to digest more nutrients due to the higher enzyme excretion. So, in other words, mom is not only supplying IGs, but she's supplying all these other things to help the calf grow and develop, absorb more nutrients, and be more anabolic. So I'm going to share a few studies. Some of these go back and forth, so bear with me. This goes back to the work of Blum and his graduate students. Uh, what they did, and I'm, again, I'm going to flip back and forth, they took colostrum and they extracted um, some of these factors out of the colostrum so they could take the extract and either add it back to a milk replacer or add it back to a colostrum replacer and look at the effects on gastrointestinal tract development. Here's colostrum versus milk and so you can see the differences. You know, the difference is in energy, protein, whey protein, you know, where everything fell out. What's important here is there's the IGF-1, 1.1 versus 23, 365 on insulin versus 67. Lactoferrin obviously went bad and got more protein here. Okay, so if you look at Bella's height for these neonatal calves, uh, there's a significant effect on these calves if you try to milk replacer and you cut the milk replacement with the colostrum extract. So in other words, the things, the factors, the growth factors of colostrum put into a milk replacer were stimulating the growth and development of uh, the intestine and the pillus, and getting you know, more crypt cells and get more surface area. At day, day five of life, they looked at the RDU incorporation, and in fact, not, you know, T equals 0.1, a nice increase in the RDU incorporation, so that means we got more cells proliferating down here in the crypts. And this is the day five of life. If you look at the day eight of life, they did the same kind of thing. They fed colostrum. Here they didn't add the, the factor back, they just said colostrum versus the formula. And you can see that there's a significant difference in the RDU incorporation in those calves than the colostrum versus the formula if they ate in life, indicating that whatever's in that colostrum, most likely insulin and IGF-1, is stimulating the growth and development of those crypt cells, which is then going to increase the growth height and things like that. So what mom was putting in the colostrum was actually stimulating the growth and development of the gut, right, to make it more absorptive, better barrier, things like that. And again, back to the bladder study, DRDU and day eight of life formula, formula plus the extract, get more DRDU incorporation down here in these crypt cells uh, when we feed or when the, the extract is fed to these cats. Right? So when they see these factors, they get better development. So, so those, those factors in colostrum can stimulate the development, the physical development, so we have more surface area. What about absorption? And again, they, they did a tremendous amount of studies to look at this. So what we have here is uh, colostrum versus formula feeding. I'm going to show you the xylose data. This is what they were really focused on. Xylose is the non-metabolizable analog of glucose. And here's hours after feeding. Um, diamond, the colostrum, the open squares of the formula. So here's the colostrum. Here's the formula. So yes, we see some xylose uptake from the formula fed calves. But look what's going on in the colostrum fed calves. Right? We're going up to here, four hours after feeding, we're about one and a half millimoles per liter. And then the colostrum fed calves are about three and a half millimoles per liter. Right? So there's something about colostrum, what's in colostrum, which is facilitating the transport of silos out of the gut. Right? Better absorption. Well, if you look over here and you look right at glucose, same kind of thing, two hours after feeding. So here's your glucose, looks fairly flat in the formula fed calves. Look at what's going on in the colostrum fed calves. In three hours, we're at about 5.5 millimoles on the plate. On the formula fed calves, we're about 8 millimoles in those calves fed colostrum. Okay. Same nutrient. The crazy thing about this is they're receiving the same amount of nutrients. Okay. So there's something about the facilitation of the nutrients across gastrointestinal tract. So they followed that up. They've done many studies. I'm just going to highlight this one. Steinhoff-Wagner published in 2011. 
Uh, here they use stable isotopes and chase the carbon around. It's a really elegant study, very expensive to do. They had seven caps for treatment, not a lot. They had colostrum versus making a formula that nutrient-wise looks like the colostrum. Okay? So seven calves, they fed them four hours on average after birth because they would analyze the colostrum to figure out the nutrient content and then feed comparable macronutrient levels to blood. Again, they use isotopes, we're not going to talk about that. So if you look at you know, the colostrum day one, and then they pool day three and four, so you day one, day two, day three and four, the lactose, 201 grams per kilogram, 260, 341. The formula, 201, 260, 338. You can do the same thing with the proteins. They match them up pretty well. With the fat, they match that up pretty well. The energy lines up really well. What they don't have, obviously, here's the colossum, 373, 192, and 86 micrograms per liter in IGF-1. There's none of that in the formula because it's not there. So Think about hormones and these other factors. Uh, now we can look at those differences because we've got identical or pretty similar natural molecules to the nutrients. So plasma glucose. Blue bars are colostrum, green bars are formula. So this is time after birth, right? And this is postnatal concentration before feed intake. So here's the colostrum fed calves, here's the formula fed calves. Colostrum formula all the way through. Greater circulating plasma glucose in the calves fed colostrum compared to calves fed formula all the way through 72 hours. If you go out to day four, here's the plasma glucose, time of feeding, zero time of feeding, you see the higher plasma glucose in the colostrum fed calves, higher than the formula fed calf. But then two hours after feeding, see this very large increase in the circulating plasma glucose concentration. You see a little rise in the formula fed calves to indicate some absorption, but not nearly the same thing. Okay? So when glucose goes up like that, what happens to insulin? Go up. Okay, when insulin goes up, what should happen to glucose? Go down. Okay. That's who the speed on. Here's the insulin. So I just lifted these uh, right out of the paper. This is insulin of fecal moles per liter. So this is day four. At time of feeding, no difference. Two hours after feeding. There's the colostrum fed calves and the formula fed calves. So the formula fed calves had normal insulin re release. It went up just like you would after any meal. But notice what happened on the colostrum fed calves. Okay, now, when the insulin goes up, what's supposed to happen to glucose? Down. Here's the glucose. Isn't that fun? Florida Pernando had the same kind of data. And in his defense, it took like two hours to get through these two graphs. Because the physiologists in the room, there's two in really fierce physiologists in the room, they just couldn't let go of this. Because they said, oh, they must be insulin resistant. And the answer to that is no, they're not. We've given those calves insulin before, and if you give them too much, the eyes roll up in their head, and eat buffalo, and you gotta give them a bunch of glucose, right? So they're not insulin resistant. But that does beg the question, if the, if the glucose is that high and the insulin is that high, how does that happen? <coughs> well, we know from this study, because they use isotopes, that uh, liver glucose production was not changed. The liver's still kicking out a bunch of glucose. Okay? From some other work, what we think we know now is that the insulin is actually facilitating the transport of glucose across the gut. And the glucose and the insulin is also doing what? Being transported across the gut. Which means that the whole thing is anabolic in a way that we haven't considered. And this only seems to be true in the first three or four days of life. And we replicated this, and I don't know if I have that study in the slide set. We'll find out in a minute. Uh, if we do, it'll make more sense to you. But there's, it isn't behaving like a normally grown, mature uh, gut yet. It was a developmental organ that now hit the ground, and it hadn't learned to be autonomous, but it had normal insulin transporters. Uh, but it also has sodium-dependent transporters for glucose. And they've been chasing the, the type of transporter that this is, and they haven't been able to find it. They've published a couple of papers and looking for a particular transporter to 
have these conferences. We're still trying to figure out how to map it, but I can tell you that we see this in other tabs. Right? I'll come back to it in a minute and replicate it slide there. I talked about, uh, I talked about uh, enzymes. Here's lactase activity. There's a the lactase activity in all these tabs that colossal versus the formula. And there's, uh, I'm sorry, that's villus height. And this is the lactate vector. So those heights greater in all the calves that blossom, and lactase activity um, is greater than P.06, but you can see higher concentrations all the way through. So the point here is that those, those bioactive factors are also stimulating, again, stimulating growth and development, but also the enzyme secretion in that calf. So mom is using colostrum as a tool to help that calf grow and develop. Right? So we talked about this, similar nutrient intake, glucose enhanced, or colostrum enhanced glucose uptake via insulin or enhanced enzyme activity in the gut, it's simply maturation. But the glucagon was higher, it had better glucose status, higher reserve capacity. What was also interesting in those calves, plasma protein levels were higher, which meant we didn't convert amino acids to glucose, so we had the ability for higher protein synthesis, less protein to glucose, and accordingly, plasma urea levels were lower. So this is, uh, yeah, here we are. When you really don't understand something, you do the very simplest study you can. We went out, we purchased a bunch of colostrum replacer, and I stole a bunch of insulin out of over some lab. And um, there was human insulin that was, was way beyond its uh, cell life. So uh, 12 calves, divided with six and six, evenly by sex, put a catheter in them, fed them the colostrum replacer, laid away the colostrum replacer, Spent about an hour and a quarter after birth. Half of them got just the colostrum replacer, the other half uh, received the colostrum replacer plus 1,000 IUs of insulin. It wasn't supposed to be that much. Uh, my student just didn't do the math. He's a surgeon now. I don't know what that means. Uh, but he's a really smart guy. So, And nobody died during the process of this. Um, but the cab did have a few moments where we had to get some more glucose in it. Sample them every 30 minutes. You gotta have fun with this, right? And he told me what he did. I just said, oh my god. Ah, measured everything for a few hours. <coughs> so, plasma insulin concentrations. The green line is the uh, plasma, is the plasma replacer without uh, any insulin. So you see the normal insulin rise, the decrease, and then we read them again out here. The blue line are the gaps in the feed that the receive the insulin. So you can see the insulin concentrations uh, were higher for a longer period, it never went all the way back down, and again, came back up. So they are definitely absorbing the insulin. Okay? It's very simple stuff, right? I haven't had the money to chase transporters and all that kind of stuff. I just want to know the real fundamental things right now so we can figure out what we really need. But this is interesting. So there's the insulin control versus treatment. There's the actual means. Look at the glucose, 69 versus 81. Right? So not only did we get an increase in insulin uptake, we got an increase in circulating glucose. So we facilitate the transport of glucose across the gut, simply by putting insulin in the cost of the Or anabolic. This is just one hormone, right? This has no idea of one or the other stuff. Right, so it says very simply that there's something being facilitated. You don't understand the transport. Like I said, uh, Hammond's group and a few others have been chasing that with very, very elegant studies. I read them and I want to cry because it works so hard and they can't figure out what, what the transporters are and what the binding sites are. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't show itself. Right? So we can let them work that out and do other things. But there's the simple, the quick theory that has happened. We, uh, we've been working on another colostrum extract, all right, a commercially available one. It hasn't, hit the, it hasn't really hit the market right yet. We've got to repeat it. We did a full blown study. This was our uh, preliminary study data. Caps fed none of this, none of the uh, extract. Uh, pounds per day gain, 1.34. We gave one dose of the extract at birth, 1.4. Two doses of the extract, we got 1.65. Four doses of the extract, the first got us 1.85 pounds a day gain. There's the inches per day difference. They were all fed the same amount of milk. Okay. So it says that it's actually 
establishing this through the enlightenment will hold on once we understand what's going on. Okay? What's my time? My keeper. Good. Okay. So I'm going to switch gears now. That's the metabolism side. Bob alluded to this because he had a colleague who was actually working on this data, uh, on extending this data, and I don't know where that is. Is it published now? I need to go find it and you can show me because I haven't found it. If this is really fascinating, you know, I'll allude to, to what ISIS did. So what happens when I say the word semantic cell count, how does everybody respond? If I was talking about goats, we'd all go, no big deal, right? Or sheep, who cares? But when I talk about cows, everybody thinks mastitis, right? Are there a lot of somatic cells in uh, colostrum? The answer is yes, there's a lot of somatic cells in colostrum. What are most of those somatic cells? The leukocytes, right? So the question is, are those leukocytes important? Or are they just a byproduct of gland cleaning itself up and gets ready to initiate lactation in my, uh, of what I read. And, and I know, again, I know there's other people that are chasing out. So if we look over the last 20 some years that leukocytes and other immune-related cells with blossom, blossom are trapped, when I say trapped, into circulation in the cat. Okay, so the same parent system that allows for the phenocytosis of those IG will also allow for these very large cells to be moved into circulation. The question is, is what is that? Mean? Right? So does this have any impact on the activity of the DNA immune system? Are there other implications? <clears throat> so if you review some of this literature, what we know is maternal leukocytes can be detected in calf circulation within 12 hours, peak at 24, and disappear by 48. Okay? But what's interesting is that those cells that start to put the whole system together, those cells that disappear aren't gone. What happens is they appear to be sequestered in the tissues and lymph nodes after 48 hours. And in fact, they've been measured in the system up to five weeks after the loss of administration. So the implication of all this is that they get in there and they don't die. And as somebody who used to play in the genetics role for a world uh, right after my graduating from Ohio State, this really screws with the geneticist's idea of genetic transfer. Because the implication here is what? What's in that every one of those leukocytes? It's a full complement of mom's DNA. And it's all of her memory about, not all of it, but a lot of her memory about what she's been exposed to. So in fact, mom is giving that cat a blueprint of herself. <laughs> if you want to go that far. You know, and I, it was, I was floored when I saw this. Right? So long term, Long term, there appears to be greater cell immunity in calves that receive full colostrum compared to cell free colostrum, right? And this is a really interesting point. Because the implication here is that we're going to have a better immune system in those calves that absorb some of those traumatic cells. And some of the other data that's out there, calves that full colostrum have greater cell immunity to find activation markers, uh, CD25 to 26, seven days after birth. They also have greater antigen presenting capacity on cell surfaces. That's interesting because it says that. They have seen things that they really haven't seen yet. Right? The cells have been exposed to things that even the cat hasn't been exposed to. And cats that hope to watch them have greater cellular immune response to this than vaccination. Okay? Well, that has really big implications to how that cat is going to defend itself uh, over its early life. So this study, uh, I was fascinated by this study. So it's the effect of maternal cells transferred with colostrum on cellular responses pathogen antigens in neonatal calves. So the calves are fed whole colostrum, frozen colostrum, and cell-free colostrum within four hours after birth. All right, so whole colostrum is going to have all of the uh, leukocytes intact. Frozen colostrum is not. Obviously, cell-free colostrum is not. Leukocytes are obtained from the calves before feeding colostrum within one to 28 days after ingestion. Here's the really interesting thing. The lipidic response is against bovine virus, diarrhea virus, and mycobacteria purified protein over the IUD. Yams received a vaccine containing an activated DVD, but were not vaccinated against the mycobacteria. So if the calves respond to the DVD, the only way they could respond to the DVD 
key is that they got the message from mom cells. Right? And they don't respond to the microbacteria that says that it didn't matter because they never saw it anyhow. Right? So, yes, sir? What happens when you beat blossom? Yeah. Yeah, it's lots of it depends on the eating. For the most part, they're probably going to die. You know, and I, I would still think it, a 60 60 is going to kill them. If you say they got this protocol, it's probably still going to kill them. Yeah, I don't think that's how much time I got. Two minutes. Okay. So, all cats had no idea of circulation at birth, but substantial concentrations by day one. Cats have received both velocity and enhanced response to the antigen, DVD antigen, one and two days after ingestion of velocity. In other words, they saw it. Okay, that's fascinating, right? It says that mom's actually sending this to the cat. It isn't anything to do with the antigens, right? It's nice, I'll count it. This is the statute. So, cats that received frozen blossom or sulfur blossom did not respond to DVD. No difference in microbacteria. Take home uptake of cells from colostrum with cancer cell immunity and cancer are probably the surface of their cells. That's cool. Right? And I know that uh, a former colleague of Bob's saw this data, worked with this data, extended this data, she repeated these studies, and she took those animals out for lactation. The animals that she took out the lactation, it would be these animals here, had better responses post capture. That for the rest of their life they had an enhanced immune response. Right? That, that wasn't just a one-shot deal, it was a lifetime. <coughs> so okay. So the take-home here, right? There's a group of dairy farmers, a group of dairy farmers, they all kind of groan when they see this. Given that mom's making colostrum, I say, let's try to figure out how to feed colostrum for four days. But I don't want to change anything that we do on the farm other than to hold the colostrum in a different place. So first looking at colostrum within six hours of birth, four quarts for large trees. No different than what we've always done. First milking colostrum, again, at 12 hours, as many calves as you can get. Second milking colostrum for day two. Third and fourth milking colostrum, which would be day two secretion for days three and four. Again, it's not going to be all they get, but if we can blend that in and focus on the calves up to four days of age, given everything I just showed you, I think that's going to be good for those calves. Right? This is what we're trying to get dairies to do. We've got some doing it. Bob, we've got a couple dairies doing it. You can tell you about their responses. My experience with this and a couple dairies that we've worked with in New York that have done this, they've had tremendous response. Okay. I think I've covered all that. Okay. A couple quick questions for Mike. This is not a question, but a comment. Uh, the Dr. Pine hypothesis is fascinating. I agree with you. It's very exciting. The uh, estrogen levels that you reported. They were very high, like 3,000 micrograms. <clears throat> uh, the estrogen levels are really very high in the mother, in the placenta. Blood levels are really high, and they go right to the ground as soon as they get. Uh, the idea maybe had estrogen added to the milk replacers. I don't. I wouldn't think that's going really to work. Uh, mainly because I've seen data where uh, estrogen implants were given to early born kids, and it really messes up the uterine differentiation. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I would never think of giving estrogen to the cat. I would never think of doing that. Because the point is, if in that first meal, there's a lot of it there, and then it goes away. Yeah. But if she does actually transmit some to the cat, that was my point. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, I would never, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with a bunch of that data. They actually, it actually downregulates the estrogen receptor to the point where they don't grow. This one? one, this one. There. Okay, just you know, I'm from the Midwest and the you know zero withdrawal dry tubes and 
selling transition milk to Zinpro and other things are very common. But you, so I want to make sure when you're talking colostrum here, you're talking the transition colostrum? Yep. They pay to try to sell them. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's a big paradigm change. Yes, I know. Okay, and then uh, when you were referring to Otterby and Foley's work in 78, and you, your rows were one, two, three, was that milking one, two, three, or day one, two, three? So that's milking one, two, three. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Do you know if anybody has looked at whether the selection of cows for higher milk yield has changed colostrum yield in composition? I, I don't find a lot of people reporting colostrum yield in the experiment, so I'm not sure if that has anybody looked at that. I can't find it either. There's some of us trying to look at that. Nobody wants to give anybody money to do something like that, so it's kind of hard to figure <laughs> it out. You know, we have, I have started to put together data though, where here's my, here's where I think this gets confounded. I think some of these high fills, there's two things going on. It's got confounding some of the colostrum data. One, the third trimester of pregnancy isn't being managed effectively in a pregnant heifer, so the heifers are protein deficient. And that starts, you know, when you've got a great growth that takes place. The second thing that happens is they transition to some of these high fill diets that we put the mature cows on. Those are really deficient in protein for some of those cows and those heifers, especially the growth requirement. So what I'm finding, one of the things that I get lots of calls on is I have heifers that won't make colostrum, or have a low volume, or have really poor protein content. And almost every one of those have been able to solve the problem by getting more protein in the third trimester and making sure the heifers have their own um, refresh diet that fits their intake and meet their energy requirements for growth and reproductive That's been a real founder here in the last few years. Go ahead. We're going to cut it off at that point since I gave Mike most of my time at the end of the presentation, which is perfectly fine because you guys don't need to listen to me talking. A couple of things. One, if you have not signed up Outside, there's a little plastic box and little cards. If you sign up, which simply means that you give us your email address, uh, we would, we are in the process right now. And by the way, thank you, Mike, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.